Good morning, Your Holiness, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Shapiro, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'll be moderating this session, and I'm on the board of the Mind and Life Institute. This has been a most uh, engaging and provocative meeting for all of us, and I'd like to offer some, uh, some thoughts that, that have been engendered in me by sitting here for the past few days. But I have to give a disclaimer to the audience and to his holiness. I am not a neuroscientist, nor am I a psychologist. I am a physician who pursued a career in, uh, in biochemistry and molecular biology. And for many years was a professor in biochemistry and then, then entered the, uh, the area of drug discovery in an attempt to find breakthrough medicines for serious disease. And I've been doing that for the past 15 years, partly in a, in a large pharmaceutical industry and in part in biotechnology. And so I've been working in the center of reductionist biology that has had such a powerful effect on transforming the way we look at the living process. When I began my career, I could never have imagined that we would have the insights today that we have about the living state, the nature of life, the relationships, the interconnectedness of all living organisms. These ideas have emerged from the deep analytic approach taken during the past half century or more, where the techniques of physics and chemistry were applied to biology. Both the techniques and the ideas from these disciplines. Mixing such powerful ideas and technologies has led to what has been truly a revolution in our understanding of the nature of life and our ability to discover novel therapies to help relieve suffering. No field has benefited as much from the introduction of <coughs> physics and chemistry to biology as neuroscience. And in fact, the whole area has been transformed. And we understand very much about how nerve cells work, how they're integrated, the chemistry of their activities. The progress has been unimaginable. <clears throat> Yet we have not made any progress of this quantity or effect in understanding the mind. So although we have deep understandings about the nature of the brain, our progress in understanding the mind has been very slow. In part, this is because Western attempts at studying this were derailed for several reasons, one of which was the enormous impetus of behaviorism, when at the end of the 19th century, it was clear that people could not report <coughs> internal states very well. Psychology shifted to consider looking at external behavior as an index of what was occurring inside. And indeed, for the first half of the 20th century, people ignored internal mental states almost completely. A few theories of mind emerged by Freud and others, but the mainstream of psychological research didn't deal with that. It dealt with the 
behaviors that were occasioned, both in animals and in people. And only in the last 20 years, 20 or 25 years, has it been legitimate to talk about something like consciousness, which is at the core of our very being. So on the one hand, we have developed enormously powerful technology that has allowed us to look at the material entity, the brain, in ways that were unimaginable. On the other hand, we have really not progressed tremendously far in understanding the nature of the mind. And so the, the question really is, how do we make progress in this area? We need to apply powerful technology. We need to apply novel insights. Most of the ways that we have determined the specific <coughs> issues about the human mind have been looking at people with strokes or other uh, brain injury and determining what was lost and inferring from their thinking and their behavior what these parts of the brain did. Or we have looked at undergraduate students and, and asked them many questions in psychology laboratories all around the world. So we've taken this cadre of young people who were taking psychology courses or in psychology departments and, and did any numbers of experiments with them together to try to infer the potential of the human mind. Now, when I think back on my mind as an undergraduate, <laughs> I, I really, it, I don't think that it was achieving the highest potential of the human mind. And so, as an outsider, and as I said, I, these comments are from an outsider to this discipline, I don't believe that many of us would consider our minds at the end of our teenage years being the acme of human potential. And so, and so one then could ask a reasonable question. Where can we turn for attempts to understand the potential of the mind? We all have agreed in this meeting that we need to somehow improve what our minds, these powerful tools, have done to our health and our planet. And so how can we turn and find ways that we can understand what really is the nature of human potential of the mind. Where do we find that? To me, it's not unreasonable <coughs> to look to people who have had enormous expertise in this area. It seems from a scientific point of view, the most reasonable thing to do, much as we would have made those decisions in any other area we would investigate. So to look at a culture that has spent thousands of years developing mental insight, like the contemplative aspects of Buddhism or Christianity, to ask those people, those people today, who have spent tens of thousands of hours in meditation in their lives, who have used rigorous technology to enter into different meditative areas, to investigate the mind in many different ways, in ways that they say are reproducible, that they can describe each to another about the quality of those states. It seems to me, as a reductionist molecular scientist, that that's the most reasonable place to turn. <coughs> if you were going to have because we're looking at people, I should say, when you do the math, who have the equivalent of four or five PhD experiences, individuals with that kind of time, who have had the equivalent of medical training and many years of uh, specialty training and practice. If you were going to have cardiac surgery, it is unlikely that any of you would turn to an undergraduate student. 
And so if you wanted to ask questions about astrophysics, and I'm not speaking against undergraduate students, having been there myself and raised them, but I think one has to approach this with some reality. If we are asking about something as serious as the potential of the human mind, it seems to me only reasonable that we would go to people who have studied it. I mean, that, that, so, so it's no surprise that the Society for Neuroscience, the leadership, the wise leadership of that society, would have invited His Holiness to come and speak to the group. I mean, you know, from the most logical point, where else would you turn? If you're really interested in changing neuroscience to have a serious attempt at looking at the mind, why wouldn't you go there? And so, you know, the, it, it, it just seems obvious on the face of it, incontrovertible, that this makes perfect sense. These people have many years of doing it. Why not ask them? And, and, and additionally, and as I'm sure we're going to hear, from our next speaker, if we have a clearer idea of the mind and its interaction with everything we know about the physical nature of reality, I think we can help heal some of the damage that's been done to medicine and other aspects of our society. So the opportunity is just enormous. The opportunity is the same opportunity that existed in the 1930s when physicists and chemists started getting more serious about biology. All of human progress has been based on technologic innovation, very much dependent upon introduction of new ideas into established areas. That's how you make quantum leaps in understanding. And in this case, we have an opportunity thanks to His Holiness and the people who put together this Mind and Life Institute and other people interested in this area, we have an opportunity, again, to bring another completely distinct way of looking at a problem that we're engaging with our tools of, of Western <clears throat> science and asking questions and asking for collaboration and asking for insights in how to address these questions. And so this dialogue that you have initiated, I think, can have the same kind of profound impact on what we're doing over the next 50 years that physics and chemistry have had on our understanding of biology and transforming the nature of that experience. Because we're asking a major intellectual discipline to be imposed upon another major intellectual discipline, and we don't know where it's going to go. So there's wonderful opportunity here. There also are great challenges. We've spoken a bit about some of the challenges already. The, the, the first challenge is an attitudinal challenge. The feeling that it's just the mind. In medicine, it's just the mind. Or when I was training as a doctor, although there is a legitimate and important journal today, called the Journal of Psychosomatic Medicine, when I was training, a psychosomatic illness was thought of by many doctors as not really being an illness at all, of being some type of, you know, some type of actual intellectual dishonesty on the part of the patient. And, you know, a very strange idea for a medical practitioner. So, so there are these attitudes that must be changed, and it will take time to change them, like the attitudes of, what can a Tibetan monk tell neuroscientists? You know, a handful of people have raised that question about His Holiness speaking at the neuroscience meeting. Clearly, those attitudes exist whenever any revolutionary technology, whenever any revolutionary idea comes in place. There are always people who are much more comfortable not in thinking about the potential of that revolution. There are operational challenges as well. As I'm an outsider to much of what's going on here, but I do know a fair amount 
about drug discovery. And let me just tell you, when we're trying to discover a breakthrough medicine, what we go through to prove that it actually works in people. Because it's very important, if you're going to impose a new therapy, to be sure that this therapy is effective and safe. In this way, we do complex clinical trials. In the first place, we use placebos that are exactly matched in shape, form, taste, all physical properties to the drug that we're testing. And we do that because, as was mentioned several times already, the placebo effect, which is a surrogate for the power of the mind, is enormous in these clinical trials. On trials of pain, it can be very large. On trials of depression, it can be so large that the drug itself is no different than placebo in many trials, and many depression trials fail because the placebo effect is so strong. Even in the swelling of joints in arthritis, there is a placebo effect. In uh, trials on blood pressure or obstruction to urine flow, there is a placebo effect, substantial. In many of these trials, the placebo effect, if the total effect size is something like 50%, the placebo effect alone might be 20 or 30 percent. So we're not talking about a small effect of the mind. We're talking about a big effect of the mind. And this needs to be controlled for in clinical trials. We also use completely randomized populations to make sure that the quality, the, the backgrounds and everything possible about the people getting the drug and the placebo are identical. And we use a triple-blinded technique. Mm -hmm. The patient doesn't know whether she or he is getting the drug. The doctor in the clinical trial when we give the drug, the patient doesn't know whether he or she is getting the drug. The doctor doesn't know whether the patient who got the drug. And the person calculating the data, the data are coded, and the person doing the calculation doesn't know who got the drug. So there's no possibility for bias. And we view this as the highest standard, although very artificial, the highest standard of intervention to try to make a difference in a person's health by administering a drug to them. And when we look at how difficult that would be to apply to the study of meditation, we understand the challenges that our colleagues face when they introduce the experiments that have been proposed to you. Clearly, it's very hard to have an identical placebo group. The, there may be a wait period that distinguishes the treated and non-treated group, the explored group and non-explored group. It's, it's very hard to randomize because many people volunteer for these trials because they've been enthusiastic about meditation or have had meditation in their past. It's hard to randomize for that. We're still developing techniques for reporting of internal states that need to be optimized. We're exploring the use of biomarkers like imaging technology to help guide thinking in this area. The fact that this is very early on as an area for investigation is clear. And so it, it is unrealistic to assume that all the technology has been perfected in the first years of exploring this area. But the courage and enthusiasm of people going through this indicate that there is enormous potential here. And we've heard in this meeting many indications of how powerful the mind can be when explored carefully in different settings. And when we talk about whether our, our guess is right about experienced contemplatives adding value, we've begun to see in early experiments from Ritchie and other laboratories that there really is difference in the potential of the human mind than what we initially thought from our earlier studies. 
Of course, the third, the third issue that we have to consider is the ethical issue. I think all of us would believe today, and certainly I believe, that mental training is extremely powerful technology. You can see the damage that has been evoked when the mind has gone in the wrong direction. There is no more powerful weapon than the human mind. And so we're fortunate. We're really fortunate and should pause and think about that, that these disciplines of tens of thousands of hours have been developed in the context of religious traditions grounded in morality from a position of motivation. That is not a problem for us. That is a blessing for us. Because inappropriately used, these technologies, one could imagine, and, and, and I should uh, just remind you that in mindfulness-based stress reduction, the whole project is grounded in the same eth ethical base because it was recognized by the people developing that how important that part of the process was. But it's possible that one could develop similar technologies <coughs> not grounded in an ethical base. And so at the beginning of a field like this, it's useful to consider what might be problems that would emerge from refining this, from bringing a technology like this, an approach, a worldview into understanding the mind, to make sure as we move ahead that we're committed to not only the highest standards of scientific excellence, but also the same high standards of ethics and morality that have acted in the generation of these of these technologies over the past millennia. That's our responsibility as well as our challenge as we move ahead. So I believe that this approach that, that has been initiated and that we're, we're at the, essentially at the early birth stages of has the opportunity to transform not only medicine and health, but much of human suffering in an extremely powerful way if we continue to develop it wisely. And so I just have to offer my deepest personal gratitude <clears throat> to His Holiness and, and to the memory of Francisco Varela and to Adam and to the other, my colleagues on the Mind and Life that have been associated with Mind and Life for so many years, who have initiated this dialogue that has so much potential to relieve human suffering. So I thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> now, we're, we're having two perspectives this morning on the meeting from two extremely distinguished scientists and, and ph physicians. And, and, you know, that's, I think that's a special <clears throat> way of gaining, a, again, some slightly different perspectives on what we've been talking about. Our first speaker is Ralph Snyderman, who is one of America's most distinguished medical leaders and educators. He was, he's a physician, he has been a scientist, and he's been head of the Duke University medical system for many years, continues to be actively engaged in all aspects <coughs> of healthcare. So we're just delighted, Ralph, that, that you can spend some Thank time you. with us. Your Holiness, it is, uh, truly a pleasure and an important moment for me and for everybody in this room to be with you. All of us have <coughs> assembled here coming from different paths. Every one of those paths is distinct and important. Nonetheless, we're all together here in this room at this moment wanting to improve the human condition to minimize human suffering, to liberate people from distress. My particular path has been as a physician. My calling has been as a healer, as a healer of human suffering 
through suffering of the body. What I have found through my 40 years of being a physician, including a physician who has had the full power of Western science and technology, and having conducted research in many fields of medicine, that the power and the tools of science and technology are insufficient to fully deploy themselves to maximum benefit to minimize suffering. For that reason, myself and many of my colleagues, and I suspect many of the people in this room, are coming here and coming to you and coming to your colleagues and the wisdom gained from 2,000 years of introspective contemplation to determine what can we learn that could be applied to improve the human condition in our world and the tasks that we are taking together. The Mind and Life meetings, which we are so grateful for, have indicated that you yourself, I believe from what you've said and what I feel, have also had that feeling that the 2,000 or more years of Buddhist tradition and the tremendous power and learning that has been achieved can benefit from a deeper understanding of science. This is a natural thing. What can we learn for each o- from each other and how can we add to the strength of the learning from two different processes? This particular Mind and Life meeting, the Mind and Life meetings have been going on, this is the 13th one, have followed a pathway. The point of this meeting is to determine what have we learned and what can we learn that can be applied mental training, mindfulness, to improve our understanding of the workings of the brain, the importance of the brain in health, health, not only mental health, but physical health, and where can we go from here? Can we use tools and understanding that we have gathered together here to go forward and make things better in the future? I believe that during this meeting, we have learned a lot. It's impossible to summarize this, but in our own heads, there are imprints that we will carry with us, but we will try to refine them together uh, this morning. But we have learned already that the focus and the training of the mind can have a very powerful impact on the brain. And perhaps if we use this power, we can do things that can improve the human condition. To be a bit more specific, we have learned some powerful messages through the presentations and through the discussions. We have learned that mental training, meditation, can actually affect the structure of the brain. It could affect how the brain works. It could change the pathways, the networks of the brain through plasticity. Mental training can enhance the portions of the brain that seem to control compassion. It can minimize the power of the portion of the brain that controls fear and anxiety and anger. That's a, it's a powerful message. We have also learned a bit of how the brain works. Very mysterious. Totally dissipated information. No central control. But we have learned that mental training can cause a coordination, a coordination of the oscillations of the functions of the different portions of the brain to come together almost as though it allows us to focus, focus on a thought. We 
have learned. We have learned that destructive emotions, components of destructive emotions, we've called them stress, but anger, fear, shock, grief, all cause changes not only in our mind, but in our body. They also cause changes in the brain. We have learned that through mental training, we could, we could change this. You have known this, the Buddhists have known this for over 2,000 years. But the, the data has been shown that through mental training, we could actually change these processes to the benefit of the individual because the stress through the brain causes changes in blood flow to the heart, can cause heart attacks, can cause ulcers, can decrease resistance to uh, many other diseases, and can cause depression, clinical depression, which is a tremendous suffering, one of the most painful mental sufferings. Clinical depression can be shown to be associated with abnormalities in the functioning of the brain. And mental training, to a degree, can improve those functionings which decrease clinical depression. Very powerful. It's not a cure, but it is a, uh, a supplement to dealing with a very painful uh, human condition. We have learned, and this is very important, through the work of uh, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, mindful-based stress reduction, mindful-based cognitive therapy, that aspects of meditation can be applied to very large numbers of people, common people, not Buddhists, not monks for sure. But through training, one can alleviate pain and suffering on the parts of many, many people. And the applications of these, the applications of these to treating disease is a matter of intense interest and an important area of discussion, I believe, uh, in this meeting. So now what I would, what I would like to do is speak from the perspective of the physician. As a physician, I'm happy your cold seems to be getting better. <laughs> uh, that pleases me greatly. I hope it's true. Uh, but as a physician, as I indicated, the pathway that I have taken has shown me that pure science and technology leads in a direction that to some degree is almost a dead end. It doesn't solve problems and in some ways creates even more problems. And I would like to go through a description of the reasons I think it is this way and how Western medicine developed the way it did with its power, its miracles and cures, and also with the problems. If we think of the practice of medicine, good. The practice of medicine in the Western world has evolved very dramatically in only the last hundred years. As we talked about, and you indicated, Hippocrates in 500 BC was the first to establish a code of ethics in Western medicine. That's one thing that was very important. But the other was... <laughs> also, to try to separate medicine from mythology. In other words, to put medicine on an objective basis, that we actually observe things and learn from what we observed. In the 1600s, it was shown 
that the heart, which was always thought to be almost a mystical object, that the heart was truly a muscle, a pump, that pumped blood. This, again, separated the human body from more spiritual <clears throat> ideas of what the heart was. Very importantly, in the latter part of the 1800s, and I would like to point to 1847, this is a very important individual that doesn't receive sufficient attention, uh, a Dr. Semmelweis in Austria, who worked in the best hospital, Western hospital in the world at that time. And there was a tremendous problem at that time. Women, young women, giving birth to children would very frequently die the, in a few days from fever, severe fever, and they would develop a lot of inflammation, a lot of pus in the, uh, in the female tract. This was called uh, purpural sepsis, but childbirth fever. What Dr. Semmelweis noticed was that the incidence of childbirth fever was very high in women who were delivered by doctors. If the women had babies delivered by midwives or delivered at home, the incidence was much lower, very, very low. What is that from? What he showed was doctors to learn because they, they used to learn by performing autopsies. They would perform autopsies in the morning of the women who died the day before of childbirth fever. They wouldn't wash their hands because there was no concept then of germs. They would then deliver the babies of these young women, and they, in turn, would develop childbirth fever. Dr. Semmelweis said there must be something on the hands of the doctors that goes from the pus of the women who died to the normal women that caused the disease. You would think that the doctors would have said, Hallelujah, we understand, this is wonderful. No, they rejected it. He was considered a, a villain, a pariah. He was considered to be crazy. <laughs> the doctors at that time believed that childbirth fever was caused by something in the atmosphere, a miasma, or they thought that it was humors, bile, wind, phlegm. They rejected him. This was an instance in which the, uh, the ability of the medical profession totally rejected something that was staring them in the face. It was only later through Koch, Pas uh, Pasteur, and Lister. Let's talk about Koch with tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is an illness that is still an important illness in parts of the world. <clears throat> Koch found that a small little agent that you need to look at with a microscope was the cause of tuberculosis. And he showed this with total certainty. This led to a revolution in medicine where science and technology seemed to hold tremendous wonders because so many diseases were caused by infection and now we had new powerful technology to be able to find it and reverse it and to fix it. Now what has happened over the last hundred years through the pursuit of science? Is it has created wonderful things, but where it is now is heavily focused on disease. We almost spend no time on health. We focus on disease. We make an assumption that for every disease, there is a single problem, a single defect, and we need to find it and fix it. We don't deal with people throughout their lives. We only deal with them when they're sick. And we have been, become accustomed 
in the Western world, in the United States, to assume that one's health is managed by their doctor and they have little responsibility or little control. Now, where does this leave us? Where does this leave us? On the one hand, life expectancy in 1900 was 40 years. Today, it's 80 years. We have doubled life expectancy in 100 years. That's almost miraculous. But on the other hand, in 1900, a young man between 15 and 25, the most likely cause of death would have been infection. Today, it's murder, suicide, drug abuse, or violent accidents. So we have made tremendous progress, but we have had consequences that are absolutely terrifying. In addition, we have an accumulation of tremendous chronic disease. Uh, diseases, uh, many of which are fostered by people's own behavior, by what they do. I think one of the problems is medicine in the Western world makes the assumption, a reductionist assumption, that for every disease, there's a causative factor, find it and fix it. We know now, we are learning, you've known this in thinking about the mind, that there is truly an emergence. There is not a single reductionist idea of disease. That people are born with a baseline risk, and then environmental factors impinge on that risk, they change the risk, and, and we have a lot of control at times of the environmental factors, what we do and what we don't do, and then disease progresses over time. Disease progresses over time. But there is a tremendous difference in susceptibility, and yet there is a lot of control. If you think of a chronic disease, you might think of rheumatism, aches and pains in the joints. Uh, you could think of, of a disease such as tuberculosis. People are born with a baseline risk. They then get exposed over a period of time. Interesting aspect of tuberculosis. If everybody in this auditorium was exposed to the bacteria that, that caused tuberculosis, a small number of people would have a very serious problem and probably not survive. A, a, a fairly large number of people would have almost no effects whatsoever. They wouldn't even know that they had it. And then in the middle, there would be a broad range of response to the same bacteria. It's the same with virtually any disease. It develops over time. In the United States today, in the healthcare system, we tend to focus on disease very late, very late when it is much worse, the ability to cure it, to minimize it, decreases, and the cost of treating it increases. The challenge that we have together is that where medicine is taking us now is moving our understanding and our ability to predict disease much earlier on. In our lifetimes, I believe, we will have the capability of determining individuals' <coughs> risk for problems long before they occur. What this does, and this may be the most important thing that I would love <coughs> to discuss with you, it gives individuals more responsibility 
and more control over their own health. The problem is, at least in the United States, people don't want to take it, by and large. People are not willing to assume that responsibility for their health. So, so in the new world of health care, where we can predict and prevent disease, the role of the individual becomes more powerful. And this is why we need to come to you for advice. As the role of the individual becomes more important, what do we do to allow people to have the awareness that health is a value, that they have responsibility for this, that we develop partnerships to get the benefit of health care, that people are willing to take it upon themselves to develop and meet goals, and have appropriate modifications of behavior. And you'll notice, Your Holiness, anger, stress reduction, a quiet mind, a forgiving mind, a compassionate mind, we believe is essential to promoting health. In my very naive way, I wonder if, as we think about meditation as a way of promoting an understanding of ethical values, whether some part of ethical values is not in how one treats their body or how one stops abusing their body. Let me go back then to summarize what we have learned in this meeting and see if it has relevance for health care, at least from my own perspective. We have learned that meditation, mental training, is capable of modifying neural networks, how the brain works, plasticity, coordinates regional brain oscillations, a very powerful tool, modifies neurosecretory functions, which means that it has powerful effects on virtually every system of the body. We have learned that meditation enhances awareness and engagement, enhances wellness, potentially through improving the immune system, may actually limit disease from uh, John Kabat-Zinn's presentation and psoriasis and, and all the other presentations about the impact of the mind on pathology. And at a minimum, it limits suffering from pain. We heard the story of not being, being shot by an arrow once but not having the pain twice. So we could have the pain from the physical event, but let's not have the mind distort it and make it much worse than it is. So these are very powerful tools. The question I have for you uh, and your colleagues to think about and to think about going forward, are there aspects of meditative practices are there aspects potentially of enhancing compassion, to have that compassion turned to a degree inward 
to ourselves and our own bodies, can we use aspects of mental training to engage people in their own health during their lifetime? Uh, let me end by saying that for me, this is one of the most wonderful moments of my life, being here with you, and I'm grateful to everybody in this space for allowing me to do this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next, next speaker is Wolf Singer, you've met earlier, distinguished uh, neuroscientist who has given us some profound insights in general about the nature of relationships within the brain and at this meeting as well. And so Wolf is going to give a, a, his perspective of what's been going on here from, uh, from that kind of background. His Holiness, it is a real great honor to be back here with you again and to share those last moments of the conference and to be able to talk to you um, and convey some of the ideas that came to my mind while I was listening to this conference. I think less patiently and less engagedly as you did. I think much of this conference um, has been on sources of wisdom and knowledge. And therefore I consider it appropriate to begin with a few epistemic considerations. And, of course, I shall approach this from a neurobiological perspective, mm -hmm. because this is the only perspective I'm familiar with. I think it is important to consider that what we can know and what we can imagine about the world is limited, is constrained by the cognitive abilities of our brains. <laughs> Now, our brains are the product, at least we believe so, of an evolutionary process. So they have been arranged through trial and error and adapted to a world. And this does predict that our brains have probably not been optimized to discover the truth behind the phenomena in the sense of Kant, the absolute truth. But it rather predicts that our brains have implemented pragmatic strategies of survival to keep the organism which possesses them alive in a world that is full of uncertainties and uh, full of uh, dangers. Now, survival chair. Yeah. Now, in order to fulfill this function, uh, brains have adapted to a world in the, the dimension of centimeters, meters, because this is the size in which we exist as organisms. Now, this is the world of classical physics. This is the world where the coordinates of time and space are invariant, not relative. And this is probably the reason This is probably the reason why it is so difficult for us to imagine, for example, the processes in the quantum world, which are difficult intuitively for us to be understood, and also for the cosmical dimension. We have no real intuition. We have no feeling for it, because we did not need to understand these processes in order to survive. Now, it is probably for the same reason of adapting to this world 
that we have very poor intuition for the dynamics of very complex nonlinear systems. We cannot imagine them very well. Now, what our brains need to do is make a model of the world in order to derive predictions for further action. It's better to know when a tiger comes rather than being surprised and being eaten. Now, it is only possible to make predictions in a linear process where causality is a simple principle. And therefore, we seem to have an innate, an innate inclination to assume that the world is linear, that it is simple. And I will show that it is, of course, not. Now, this, this simple preconception of how the world is organized, that worked well at the times when our brains had been shaped in evolution, when we were still monkeys, as you said the other day. Um, so it also shaped uh, the cognitive instruments that we have. And it is probably this simple-minded assumption that made us, particularly us Westerners, assume that somewhere in our brain we have to have this mover that we talked about two days ago. Because we seem to also assume that our brain works like a linear machine, like a clockwork. So we think that uh, it is following the same material processes as classical physics has shown for clocks and simple machines. Now these systems, we know, they are not creative, they are not intentional, they cannot take the initiative, and they are not capable of producing surprise. But we, of course, experience ourselves as creative, as intentional, as open towards the future, as indetermined, as free, and we observe the others as being the same. And so, since we make this linearity assumption, we think there must be something in the brain which makes all those wonderful things happen. And this is probably the reason why we postulate this mover to whom we attribute all these mysterious properties of an immaterial self in particular here in the Western societies. Now, as we had already said two days ago, the scientific approach in the Western societies has now shown that the brain is not a simple linear machine, but it is a highly complex self-organizing um, system with very, very nonlinear dynamics that operates far away from equilibrium. And such systems have all these properties. Uh, that we usually attribute to the immaterial mind. Because these systems, they can be creative, they are open in the future. And a, a particularly important property of such systems is that they can support the emergence of new qualities, qualities that cannot be deduced from the properties of the components, like intentionality or consciousness <coughs> or morality. And it is an interesting puzzle that this system, which has all these intuitions, 
and conceptions and wonderful functions has so little understanding of how it actually works. We don't feel it. It's a fantastic internal misunderstanding. <clears throat> now, I think that this um, situation, in particular in the Western world, has led to a conceptual dichotomy between the world as the world in its material manifestation, which is essentially a world of classical physics, mechanics that is fully predictable. And on the other side, this mental world, which is immaterial and devoid of any constraints, fully indetermined. This is at least how we thought it was. And this view, as we now know, is in conflict with Western science, much less in conflict with Eastern intuition for interesting reasons. Now, I think um, that this view of the world is, in part at least, responsible for two very characteristic attitudes of Western civilizations. One is our strong emphasis on the self as the essence of everything. So the emphasis on the autonomous, free, and hence fully responsible mover, who is more or less almighty. And the second attitude that is very pronounced in the West because of this conceptual dichotomy is that we, the conscious selves, think that we can fully control and direct this stupid, simple, mechanical world. <laughs> now, it is fascinating to me, and I learned this over these days, that other cultures, especially the Eastern cultures, have developed a very different intuition about the position of the self in the world, about the organization of the world, an intuition that is apparently much less in conflict with modern science than our traditional Cartesian Western intuitions. Now, I don't know why this strange bifurcation in the, the cultural development occurred. This would be an interesting topic of study. So Eastern intuitions, for some unknown reason, seem to be closer to what modern science is now about to discover. And I asked a Chinese colleague a couple of years ago, how is it that your cultural development has been so conservative? Why have there not been all those turmoils like in the West, from classic uh, philosophy and architecture over to Gothics and Baroque, and then the time of enlightenment, and then we had another series and sequence. And, and his simple question was, because we had the right intuition from the beginning. So, so he said, no further search was, was required. <laughs> And he added that maybe that this was also the reason why they did not have to develop the kind of analytical sciences as we have here in the, in the West, but they directed their search towards the inner world. So here is then a very curious bifurcation of cultural evolutions um, that led to widely diverging views of the human condition. And also then, as a consequence, to radically different concepts of the self. And as a consequence also 
two very different exploratory strategies of the world. On the one side, the spiritual techniques of self-exploration by meditation. So a method that is entirely dominated by the first-person perspective. And we in the West, with the scientific approach, we opted for the third-person perspective, get outside of the things, look at them, and analyze them. Now, this raises an interesting question. How do we know which view is the right one? If this is not a silly question to begin with, maybe it's an ill-posed question. And finally, it boils down to the conclusion that obviously we have two sources of knowledge. One that uh, relies on intuition, on self-exploration, first-person perspective, and the other one that relies on observation, analytical, formalism, description, <coughs> our science. But ultimately, the question comes down to the real question, how does the brain, who does all this cognition, know when it is right? How is it? <laughs> and this is important, equally important for the scientists as for the meditators. I mean, how does the brain know when it has reached a state that is uh, a correct state, that the search process has converged towards a result? And then, how do we know how reliable this result is? Because all there is in the brain, as we think we neuroscientists, is neurons talking, very complex patterns. So how does the brain distinguish a pattern which is nonsense, or a pattern that is generated while it looks for a solution, from a pattern that is a good solution? And we have no answer to this interesting question. Is a field of research should be. But one can speculate. And while I was hearing what the practitioner said here, it, it occurred to me that maybe result states are characterized <coughs> as very coherent states where a sufficiently large number of neurons distributed over a sufficiently wide area of the brain get into coherent, stable activation patterns that are maintained for a sufficiently long period of time in order to convince the rest of the brain this is the result. We don't know, but it could be that the meditative states strive towards such solutions. So what we know is that brains do have um, systems for the evaluation of internal states, and when the brain reaches a result, these systems create pleasant feelings. The aha, or heureka, is always associated with a pleasant feeling. We like to have a solution. So <coughs> I thought that maybe meditation is a strategy that the brain applies in order to make it possible for itself to strive towards such pleasant states where controversies are resolved and both at the level of conscious arguments as well as at the level of subconscious competition uh, where always many states compete to win and somehow they have to be reconciled and maybe meditation is one way to uh, get these many different agents that work in parallel to make temporarily peace. Now this leaves us with an interesting question. The first is, how can a distributed self-organizing system that is endowed with all these wonderful properties impose on itself a programming strategy that favors the generation of such states of solutions? How can the system itself make itself get there? I don't know how this is possible.
And the second interesting question is uh, whether we can actually be confident that the system, when it intentionally reclines itself on itself, converges towards a good state, or whether it can also run into a deleterious bifurcation. And this raises the question that we have addressed several times during the meeting, and you have just alluded to it again. Um, the question whether we need to rely on the wisdom that has been accumulated by trial and errors, by the practitioners of Eastern meditation techniques over millennia, um, in order to get it right. And that hence, when we do it, we should rely on careful supervision, as with all other techniques, as you said, you wouldn't go to a grad student, no, you said it, uh, in order to get your heart fixed. Or there is a different possibility. It could also be that evolution has endowed our brain with self-stabilizing mechanisms which make that it will always safely enter the good state if we leave it in its default mode, if we just decouple it from the outer disturbing world and let it go with itself. Maybe it's done that way, that would be even better. Now, now I would like to conclude with a Gedanken experiment that establishes a link between complex systems that exist on very different scales, our brains and our societies, that seem to have very similar properties, although they look quite different. An experiment that I think will make it very, very clear that it is high time to reconcile science with Western and Eastern intuitions. If we want to be able to cope both with the practical and the psychological challenges that we are going to face in the near future and already facing it now. Um, so the experiment goes as follows. If one asks a neuron in the brain, what are you doing? The neuron would say, well, I'm sitting here, comfortably many other neurons around me, I'm getting signals from 10,000 others. I'm doing some very simple operations, calculations, and then I send a signal to another 10,000. And this neuron would never, ever tell you that it is part of a machine that generates consciousness, empathy, feelings, nothing of that. It has no concept of responsibility whatsoever. Now, I think one does get the same restrained answer, asking a member of our society, a human being, look, what are you doing? And the human being will tell you, well, I am embedded in a family and I have children and I educate and I do this and that. But I think this answer falls as short of what somebody who would be looking from onto this whole system from above would give with respect to the goal of development, if there is a goal, the trajectory of evolution of this cultural system which is life on this planet, as incomplete as the answer is relative to what the brain does that the neuron gives, I think our answers that we can give are as incomplete with respect to what it means to be integrated in this body of life. So, even though we make the life on this planet move and cultures evolve and conditions change, even though we are the agents 
we don't really know how this whole thing, um, the quality of the whole thing. So it, it's nearly sure that we lack the intelligence to understand the conditions in which we are bound. In particular, if one considers the evolutionary constraints of our cognitive systems, we have not been built in order to understand these things. What is sure is that the system we are involved in cannot be controlled by us. Even if we knew more, we would not be able to control its dynamics because it's an evolutionary system, it's nonlinear, and even if we turn screws and we think we want the system to move into a particular direction, it will go somewhere else. We cannot deliberately steer a system like our economical systems, our social systems, is in principle impossible. This is what modern science tells us. And I think we are already experiencing this now. All these linear strategies worked well when the world was still simple and we were jumping around between trees, but it's no longer so. Now, I think we start to feel that we can no longer control the dynamic processes that we generate. And this gives us a feeling of helplessness and of abandonment. And this hits Western civilization particularly harshly because of our well-nourished illusion that the almighty self would be able to control everything. And I think there's a real danger in the West and I think we have signs that one can see very clearly here in Washington in particular. <laughs> that there is a danger of a collective depression because of this collective feeling of helplessness which engenders the danger of biting neighbors for relief as we had seen with these rats. <laughs> I can't understand anything. I can't understand anything, can you? So, what are the lessons that we learn from this? And this is what I learned from this meeting. And I'm very, very grateful for it. I don't know whether it will be possible to translate this into normal life tomorrow morning when the neurosciences start with all the competition again. Um, well, probably the first message is let's try to become more humble after we understand that we cannot know then we Westerners should probably reduce the emphasis that we put on the almighty self. And I shall... We will have to learn to endure the helplessness because this will not go away. We will just have to learn to endure it and find peace in ourselves in the present rather than through biting, if possible. And then, and this has also been said during the conference in the context of stress reduction, um, we will have to learn to enjoy openness, the may be, as one of the speakers said, and to be comfortable with it and not look for certainties because we won't be able to obtain them. And this is particularly important in times of globalization. We will have, yeah, I'm right, I, I finished right now. We will have to develop what I would like to call long-distance compassion, the ability to care for those who are remote, which is very difficult for us beings. <laughs> now, you must not interrupt me because I ran over my time. Um, I think the past days have shown very clearly that certain of those traits can be learned through mental practices and that we should take this chance very seriously. Um, I would also like to say that we should, of course, not abandon Western achievements, not deconstruct the concept of the responsible self. What we could reduce is the selfish self, the self that finds its only satisfaction in what we call self-realization. We should also not abandon science. On the contrary, we will need science and knowledge to survive, but we need to give it the place it deserves it is just one of several sources of knowledge. 
Conversely, the Eastern societies, I think they run the danger in the moment, and they should be warned to not sacrifice their achievements for the sake of striving towards Western achievements solely. So, I think then ahead of us is, is a responsible and difficult obligation to select and mutually adopt strategies that have been developed in order to cope with life, but have evolved independently in different cultures, but they should in principle be mergeable and compatible because they have evolved in the same world for the solution of exactly the same problems everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolf. A wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, Your Holiness, it would be very helpful now, I think, to expand upon this issue of the self and its uh, interactions, confused, damaging, helpful, with the rest, of, uh, the rest of being. You spoke about that a bit yesterday, and I wonder whether you could expand on some of this this concept of the self. In Western society, we've been damaged so much, yet helped so much by the individual. And the need to integrate the individual in a positive way. And I know this has been a central aspect of Buddhist thinking, and it would be helpful to hear your thoughts that would emerge from some of these ideas. Hmm. 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 Uh, probably the best answer is um, one of the values that uh, uh, Wolf pointed out that is required, that is humility. So probably humility is the best answer. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, I think uh, in human, the human mind, there is some kind of desire to so want to know everything. So therefore, the concept of enlightenment comes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that means we accepted our knowledge in any case limited right? uh, uh, Konga the my shame is an she Susan maybe she doubt as only never she had a busy that the Tyson of the request of child me she about to be able to she about to be a listening to Wolf's wonderful presentation uh, and particularly the point you made about how it is uh, almost impossible to account for uh, the cognitive and, and mental processes, the emergence of mental processes or the nature of mental processes simply on the basis of a linear materialistic de deterministic account um, seems to uh, suggest that there is, you know, as a, as a result of the, the coherent uh, synchronization or whatever may be the reason, there is uh, a kind of a, an energy which the Buddhists would call the, the mental states or, or the consciousness. 
now you also refer to the intuition of this idea of there being a kind of some kind of controller self i think in india almost i think 3000 years the people or intellectual people very intelligent right. people right. i think uh, begin to investigate uh, where is i where is self no? uh, some then eventually 3000 years uh, one concept oh there should be something independent i must be there then later buddha is he taught there is no unchanging permanent self not there but self or i uh, is designated on the combination of this sophisticated sort of city Uh, brain and the mind so the no oh, combined together. coming together now uh, combine combination these two on that basis self just designated so we cannot find self something mm. its own Concrete entity mm. or its own sort of the reality reality ジャンガチルモリアダユトンゴルスモルベタカデジデユレチリアナタユセジサムシタンゴドワ。ディスチェンコルペゲコシカソレシディムネジュズスメテコチェンジルコモイネチルテネディスンタシェレタユカソレチ
experiences on the one hand and mental experiences of thoughts and emotions on the other. And with relation to sensory perception, such as visual perception, the understanding is that if you have a visual perception of a blue object, um, the content of that experience is simply the blue object. There is no reflexive uh, uh, aspect to that. That reflexivity really has to come subsequently, which is, from the Buddhist point of view, would be occurring at the mental level of thought. Yes, I'm seeing a blue. This is blue. Shazagata, and the laser did did do Shendamato. Digang, yeah, the low young, the young, the way in the tribe in solo, that is now shaving the tribe in the Motu in Sadi, that is circular, that is your children. So this seems to be quite similar to your intuition that on the individual neuronal level, you know, they, there is no this reflexive quality. They, they are simply performing whatever function they are doing. Whereas this second act of second order cognition has to occur on a different level. Oh. So even in the mental domain, um, if you uh, examine individual events of mental experience, uh, you might have, say, for example, cognition of a particular object or an event or a state of affair. Um, by themselves, other than uh, cognizing whatever the uh, object may be, um, uh, it would be very difficult even for these mental states to have this second order um, um, a reflexive um, awareness of that this is, this, is, this is true, this is correct. And that, that validation really has to come from a subsequent uh, experience or in relation to some other mm. experience. Mm. That kind of verification or validation. So, didn't you have an umavish on us from the day? As a dandy, any hey, as we know, no one can talk about you. And that's something in the shadow of a coward. So, that tell you, tiny with some machine, you know, tiny with some machine, you know, you know, that the. So, for example, in uh, Buddhist epistemological text, particularly according to uh, one school, the Middle Way School, uh, uh, the Madhyamaka School, uh, there is the discussion that uh, in order for a particular cognitive event to be veridical, to be uh, uh, valid, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it must be, it must relate to the object, whatever that it, it, object may be. And secondly, that cognition <coughs> should not be contradicted uh, by other valid experiences that one has. Um, so what this suggests is that the validity, <coughs> the validation of that mental uh, experience can only be, uh, uh, can only occur uh, in the, within the context of uh, confirmation of other, uh, other experiences as well. And then, of course, in, in the, in the, uh, from the Buddhist point of view, a, a third uh, criterion is added, which is that this should not be controverted uh, even by uh, um, insight into the deeper nature of reality, which is, you know, a very specifically Buddhist criteria. So, 
His Holiness was saying that he feels that this kind of discussion may have some uh, connection to the points you have raised. Yeah, Chancellor. Alan, Alan, you want to add something? Oh, I think it's wonderful. Not right here. Him to get. Get on that. Well, how about, uh, does that have to be related or? Uh, there were a few points related to our meetings. Where there were two uh, kind of topics which I thought were preeminent. It's going from mental disease to normal state and then possibly to an optimal uh, way of being. And there was also quite a few topics raised about uh, anxiety, fear, <coughs> uh, depression, sense of insecurity. And so... Uh, of course, Alan spoke about a demonia, uh, a demonic well-being as opposed to uh, hedonic pleasure. But we also came in a former meetings between Alan, Richie, and other friends uh, on the kind of uh, trying to be more explicit about the definition of wellness and well-being, which seems to have been central to the idea of going to a normal to a more optimal, optimal way of being. And so we came with the idea of uh, sukha, which is uh, usually tr sometimes translated by happiness, which is a very vague word, as being a, a very healthy, extraordinarily or optimally healthy uh, state of mind, a way of being, uh, that suffuses all emotional states and which can perdure uh, through all the ups and downs, or whatever may come one's way in life. So in a way, if you would compare uh, pleasure and pain, or the uh, difficulties, or happiness, or adverse or positive circumstances in life, maybe like the different state of the surface of the ocean, as being uh, storms from time to time, or a very beautiful mirror-like uh, piece on the surface of the ocean, to the depth of a way of being that can remain uh, throughout all these different states. And hence the sense of cultivating and also the sense of wisdom in understanding the, the qualities of that state, distinguishing it from pleasure, which we did in a few occasions, but just to summarize that, we could say that pleasure is a sensation that depends upon object, time, circumstances, that change in, into a neutral state and sometimes into disgust, that is an element of tiredness in it. If you listen to the most beautiful music for 24 hours, it becomes exhausting. And then, so it changes of nature. It's not something that the more you experience it, the more it grows deeper and, and more fulfilling, but rather you get exhausted. Now, if it's a way of being that is cultivated, that is associated with a cluster of qualities, such as inner strength, inner freedom, compassion, altruistic love, and so forth, then it's rather the opposite. It's a way of being, therefore, that is less vulnerable to the outer circumstances, although the outer conditions influence it, yet it is something the more you experience it and understand what leads to, to the flourishing of that inner well-being, then it will become more clear, deeper, more stable. So that is a more optimal in the sense that that can become, not a second, but again, your real nature. And that leads also to the sense of fear and insecurity is because if you only depend upon the ups and downs, it's like the wave breaking at the shore. Sometimes you are elated, surfing on the top of the wave. Sometimes you crash on the rocks and you are depressed. So you need that precisely for not feeling, having this feeling of insecurity. And then to tie it up to the notion of self-importance, exacerbated self-importance or self-concern of bringing everything back to your own concern is actually one of the main source of insecurity because being always concerned about yourself, you are a target constantly of everything that all the arrows, it's not two, it's a thousand arrows. The arrows of jealousy, resentment, hatred, is going to shoot all the time on that feeling of self-importance that is so limited. Hence the feeling of insecurity. That's why uh, genuine conf inner confidence comes from somehow 
breaking that limited bubble of self-centeredness. There is no more such target. Therefore, this is genuine self-confidence. It doesn't have to do with the triumphant ego, but rather with uh, something being attuned to reality, understanding interdependence, than less insecurity. Now, in terms of deep anguish or anxiety, there also might be an element of failing to recognize or appreciate or be able to do so the potential for change that comes, for instance, with a more altruistic sense of cognit cognitiveness with others, a deep compassion that makes you ready to act for the benefit of others. So the identifying that potential within ourselves is a great chance of a direction and hope and then uh, an antidote to hopelessness and hopelessness of course when you feel to f be dropping in the bottomless piece of depression you need that ledge which Ellen mentioned from which you can progress further but pr the ledge is the identification of this potential for change and according to the Buddhist tradition we all have that not as a dogmatic statement but because this is really the deepest nature of our mind we give the example of the nugget of gold that is unchanged even if it's in the mud or the sun, the sun behind the clouds that always be rediscovered if you blow up the clouds so that sense that there is a possibility to actualize that flourishing of well-being so it connects the notion of well-being excessive self-importance connected with the self anxiety and anguish in, a, in maybe a broader picture that is at the heart, I think, of the, of the Buddhist path. And, and getting back to Wolf's question about how do you know, how does the mind know, how does the brain know when it's there, I, I presume that you're saying this, there's an internal, you were speaking about an internal sense of suddenly clearing the clouds and having that, that sense that you actually have arrived or are arriving at those places. Of course, nothing is sudden. I mean, the real test is always like the harm of a, of a clock. You don't see it moving if you stare at it. But after some time, it's, it's in a different place. So hence the notion of skill and cultivation. If you don't see after months or years of practice that you're somehow your hostility, jealousy, and so forth has, has not decreased, you better do something else, go to the beach. I'd like to ask uh, Father Keating whether you, you've participated in this dialogue for the days that we've been doing it. You've been thinking about these intersections for a long time, and certainly these issues of the self and how to, how to deal with that are part of your tradition as well. It would be very helpful to get some general sense from you about the context of this discussion, the general discussion, and maybe the more specific discussion, if you would, please. It's been a wonderful uh, learning experience for me to, to hear these experts in various health uh, areas to explain uh, disease and the brain and uh, other such things. I, I especially identify with their openness of mind and their openness to uh, the spiritual dimension of the human condition. Uh, it seems to me that you've, uh, I think it has been mentioned, but I'd like to reinforce it by saying that 400 years religion and science have been at one another's throats if they got that close. <laughs> <laughs> and I see this, uh, your work and especially this conference, which is my first participation in it, as, as getting a toe, so to speak, in the door or that has separated us. I engage in a great deal in interreligious dialogue, and I now see that, uh, that science is, is also a religion of sorts, and uh, it has its own dogmas and rituals and so on. And so I... I deeply welcome the invitation to be participate in, in, in a deep dialogue with science. Uh, I'd like to add just here that in the, in the Christian perspective, at least in the early fathers of the church, 
they, they accepted two books of Revelation. One was the sacred scriptures, and the other was nature. So nature is a revelation of God, just as valid as the uh, uh, gifts of the prophets of the Old and New Testament. So that means that this, the work of science and the discoveries of technology are revelations of God to us today. And never before, as has been pointed out, is, is there such a multiplication, expansion, depth, breadth of, of research <laughs> going on. And, and certainly to me, this is telling me more about God than almost anything else, because I've read the scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm interested in is finding out who God is. And uh, as Einstein said, uh, didn't he, uh, uh, nature uh, it, or science are God's thoughts. So, so uh, scientists are just as much on the spiritual journey as we are in the monastery, as far as I can see. And, uh, and uh, now to shift for just a moment, uh, perhaps... Uh, to put a context on the Christian spiritual journey, I, th I think it applies to all the Abrahamic religions. The Garden of Eden is, uh, however mythological it is, uh, is communicating very profound truths about hu human nature. The great uh, temptation in the Garden of Eden, if you recall your catechism, <laughs> is that uh, Adam and Eve were tempted to become God or to be gods. Well, well this is the central drama of the human condition. And, and it comes down to this. Do you want to become God on God's terms? Or do you want to become God on your own terms? That's the only alternative there is. And so if we become God on our own terms, then you're out of paradise, you're out of happiness, you're out of health, and you don't become God at all. So, so th this vision or this revelation of the truth of human nature is really a a desire, an ultimate desire to be happy, and that's translated into health, holistic health at least. This, this puts us in a, uh, with a, uh, a context in which we can understand the ills of human nature, body, soul, and spirit, that are our are, are, are experience of human nature. So how this comes about, I think, is, is, is very significant for the health profession. If we're looking to become God on our own terms, you, you are very sick indeed. It's inevitable. Because this isn't reality. This isn't where it is. So our illusion is that if we, if we attain certain things, we'll be healthy or happy. But it doesn't happen because... It isn't the way it is. So as a result of being uh, tossed out of the Garden of Eden, three things happened, uh, at least symbolically, to, our, to the human race. It, it is sunk in illusion. It has no idea anymore where true happiness is to be found. Hence, it seeks happiness in the wrong places. And this is the source of illness. Or finally... If it ever is wise enough to find where true happiness might be found, it, it uh, realizes it's too weak to do anything about it anyway. So, so one of the deep issues of trying to become God or happy or healthy 
is to be willing to accept that weakness, to be content to have, uh, to be limited, and, and, to be, and to feel the need for the support of others, to feel uh, accountable for all the other members of the human condition that are seeking happiness in the wrong place. And, and this is the gift, I think, of deep meditation, of, of post-conceptual meditation. And, and this is why it is so important. It opens us to reality before we start thinking. Not that thinking is not a great advance over our mammalian ancestors, but it's, it's, it's the gift of, of being able to go beyond thinking to the intuitive presence of reality, to the bonding that takes place beyond uh, rational <coughs> consciousness, and that can best be described by love. And love is that capacity to, to know at the deepest level of knowledge, which is beyond knowledge itself of a conceptual kind. So, so the Christian ascetical and mystical tradition talks in this context of, of seeking God on God's own terms. Now you can call God by other names and, he's, uh, and he still is God. <laughs> or she is still God or it is still God. <laughs> God suffers from worse names than God. <laughs> but the contemplative vision, it seems to me, shows God as so close to us, that God is, is closer than we are to ourselves, that our whole being emerges from this ground or this presence. And the great contribution of the Christian religion, it seems to me, is that this presence is, is tender, loving, motherly, concerned, caring, health-giving, all, all the relationships of love that we know of rolled into one and, and given totally gratuitously with the invitation that uh, as God is our host, so he invites us to treat the rest of humanity as if we were their host also. In other words, to pass on the great goodness that we are constantly receiving. Uh, I might just mention that uh, right now the Contemplative Outreach is, a, is an organization that is designed to recover the Christian contemplative tradition from earlier times. It, it is somewhat fallen into neglect, dissuitude, and positive opposition in some places. So most Christians need to be converted. <laughs> I, I certainly include myself because in the order I belong to, we take a vow of continuing conversion. That is to say, it's a way of saying that, uh, that we don't take ourselves as a fixed reality, but we think of the self as, a, as not a fixed point of reference. Hence, it can change. It can grow, expand, and its capacity for truth and love and happiness is constantly expanding. I think the Buddhists would call this compassion or have other terms. So, so in my one, uh, chances to, to dialogue with the other great spiritual traditions, we see something emerging that is beyond interreligious dialogue, which might be called interspiritual dialogue, which is that common bond that is uh, experienced by those who are committed to the transformative process. And, and what contemplative outreach tries to do is to make that monastic vision available 
to people living in the world or in intense active ministries and a source, a resource of strength for those engaged as you folks are in very difficult ministries. So the heart of the discipline of Christian meditation is silence, which is not emptiness, but which is listening at a deeper level in the ears or even the heart can go. It's a listening to that energy out of which everything emerges, which is both energy and no energy, which is nothing and everything at the same time, and which invites us into its own immense freedom. If you'll just sit down and shut up, <laughs> maybe for 20 minutes. It doesn't matter how we sit. It does matter if to discontinue the habits of looking for happiness in the wrong place. And it's thinking that sustains that and that makes us all quite ill. <laughs> Alan, I think you, Alan, you wanted to, I can see you were provoked into asking, please. I've been percolating. I'm sorry. I'd like to bring together two themes. One is from the very eminent historian Daniel Burston, who wrote a, a history of humanity's discoveries over the last 5,000 years. And in the preface to that book, he commented that the greatest impediment to discovery throughout the whole of human history was not ignorance, <coughs> but the illusion of knowledge. The belief that we already knew something that in fact was merely an assumption, and as long as we're holding on to the illusion of knowledge, it impedes actually breaking through and gaining actual knowledge. So there's one theme. Another theme is from His Holiness when he said, if you isolate any moment of cognition and awareness of any sort, and try to determine within itself whether it's valid, you may be in an impossible situation. You can determine that it's valid in interrelationship with other moments of cognition. Also, individuals, myself, Tutanjimba, I can understand or evaluate whether my own cognitions are valid with respect to another person. So already, am I seeing that glass correctly? Well, I ask him. If we take that as a metaphor, we have a moment of cognition called neurobiology for the last 30 years, which has its own perspective. And in that perspective, there are bound, there is certainly a lot of knowledge. There may be also illusions of knowledge. For example, about the nature of consciousness. Is consciousness purely a function of the brain? It's a good question. In so far as one is focusing entirely on the brain, then what other conclusion could one possibly draw? On the other hand, if you spend those 30 years or 3,000 years primarily studying mental phenomena, then you might draw a different conclusion. So the simple point here is that multiple theories, moments, multiple moments of awareness may be validated or checked best when they are brought into conjunction with moments of awareness or perspectives that are radically other. So that we can look upon each other, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Buddhism, the philosophy of Greek antiquity, modern, modern neurobiology, that the way forward may be to overcome the illusions of knowledge by engaging deeply and respectfully and humbly with people who share radically different visions. A final point here in terms of the intercontemplative, and that is, I think there's a common assumption that the religions, from a secular perspective, that the religions of the world, in terms of any truth claims, cancel themselves out. Because religion, Christianity and Buddhism say many different things on many fronts, and Hinduism, Taoism, and so forth, so when you shuffle them all together, they've all collapsed themselves into nothing. And therefore, the only moment of cognition that seems to be standing is science with nothing to bounce off of, because religions have canceled themselves out. It can be also said in terms of contemplative practice, it's often believed that, well, the contemplative traditions basically feel they already know the answers, and then you set out on your contemplative path and are guided to get to the right answer. 
And if you deviate from that, then your teacher brings you back and says, not that way, we already know the right answer, keep on meditating until you get to the right answer, which is then in completely incompatible spirit with the spirit of scientific inquiry, where it's the don't know, the don't know motive, and w waiting for something fresh. So I think, in my, as I'm putting these various problems together in my mind, there seems to be a solution that rises up, and that that is a strong return to empiricism, and a strong return to a, to a clarity, what don't we know and what do we know? And it's very hard to find that out when we only engage with people who have very similar mentalities to our own. What do we know, what don't we know? And returning, as Father Thomas was saying, a spirit of empiricism in Christianity, back to the contemplative experience, not resting with all the right answers from the doctrine. The same for the Buddhist, and I would love to see, and this is again William James, we'll, in, we'll invoke him one more time, a return to a spirit of empiricism in religion, where we may indeed find that multiple contemplative traditions operating out of initial very different frameworks, the Bible, the sutras, the Vedas, and so forth, perhaps when we go to the deepest experiential level, there are profound convergences. There may be universal contemplative truths that the Christians have found in their own laboratories, and the Buddhists have found in their laboratories, and the Taoists in their laboratories. And if there is some convergence there, these may be some of the most important truths that human, men, human beings can ever access. Alan, uh, I think that was just so beautifully said, and, and it stresses the kind of empiricism that we're trying to achieve in these dialogues because we're trying to be open-minded and to know that we don't know as much as we think we know and to be wary because the biggest danger I completely agree and in medicine as well the biggest danger is thinking that you know more than you actually know and that's when you really start doing harm you make assumptions that go far beyond your knowledge base so and, and I think and you said it perfectly for everything that we're engaged in as a collective group it really is central I know in this regard the issue of uh, the essential good qualities of humans and the, the quality of compassion have come up repeatedly in these discussions. We always seem to get, get back to, uh, to something that important because we understand that that's a step on the path to linking us to other people that maybe all of us can achieve. And, and I know that Sharon has spent a lot of her recent time engaging in, in, uh, in, in compassion-related meditations and teaching compassion to large groups of, uh, of lay people who were not necessarily Buddhists or following any particular path, but were interested in that. I just wonder whether in this mix of ideas you'd mind casting a few, few thoughts in that direction. Uh, well, it was funny when I was looking through my uh, notes that I had taken throughout this conference, on every page, there appeared uh, two words. One was compassion, the other was helplessness. Either, I think every speaker used the word helplessness or said something that made me think of the word helplessness, um, which I found, found quite interesting, especially in the light of this morning's presentation. And somehow the coming together of the recognition of how much we need to care as a, a natural outcome of seeing the world in a certain way and also how little control we have over making things be the way we want um, is a very powerful coming together. I think that uh, very often in the West I find that even though compassion in some way is held up as an ideal, it's also in its manifestation as kindness is also discounted many times. It's almost as though it's a kind of secondary virtue. You know, if we can't be brilliant and we can't be brave and we can't be wonderful, well, at least we can try to be kind. As though it was, it was really sort of meager or mediocre in some way. But I think the living reality of people's lives day to day is that it's a tremendous thread, and it's something that is of great importance to not only live in a better way, but to have that bigger view of, of what life is. 
And I'm, I'm going to be uh, teaching a class here in Washington, D.C. on compassion um, next year. And I, it's a, a five-week class. And at first I thought, well, I'll make it a requirement of the class that you have to engage in some kind of service. You have to volunteer maybe at a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter or something like that. And then the organizer of the class said to me, well, what if somebody is taking care of an ill parent? Does that count? Or is that not enough? Do they have to go out and do something special? And I was so embarrassed, actually, because I thought of how many people do I know who are taking care of an ill parent or have a troubled child or um, a sick friend or something, you know, and, and really that is the, the challenge and the confrontation of our lives every day. You know, what is, what is compassion? What is kindness? Uh, how can I live it? Um, and then I just wanted to, uh, to come back to that point of <coughs> helplessness uh, I know that the teachings talk about different levels of compassion and different kinds of compassion and the compassion where we feel we can do something for the situation. And then the compassion where we feel we can't do something for the situation. I was wondering if His Holiness would, would like to speak about that for a few minutes just because uh, it is such a powerful consideration. Does compassion change to something else then or is it supported by our our insight our wisdom into emptiness like what happens to sustain compassion when we also feel kind of helpless so compassion when the situation seems impossible or we yeah. don't know your holiness uh, could could you mm. だんだんだ。だ、ビジョンアンサーですけど、ちょっと。だめじゃんだ。だ、ビジョンアンサーですけど、ちょっと。だ、ビジョンアンサーですけど、ちょっと。だ、ビジョンアンサーですけど、ち
Of course, within that type of compassion, there can be uh, some type of compassion where it is primarily a form of empathy and a sense of wish that other person be free of suffering. But in some cases, the compassion can be more powerful where it's not simply a wish to see other from uh, see other free from suffering, but also. So, in the case where it's not simply uh, a wish to see others free from suffering, but there is also the added dimension of the willing to help the other person to be free of suffering. And here, it's the wisdom that plays the role, and it's a more f- powerful type of compassion. And then, of course, the text also speaks of uh, boundless compassion and so on. And great compassion. Uh, the great compassion is defined as that forceful compassion which then gives rise to the altruistic aspiration to seek uh, enlightenment for the benefit of all. Mm. Mm. So, uh, according to the Mahayana texts, the Buddhist texts, uh, when an individual has generated great compassion within himself or herself, then the Buddha nature has been awakened or, or activated. Thank you. Well, we've had our organizers being silent up to this point, and I'm sure that each of you has something to say as we start winding down this meeting. So uh, please, why don't, why don't one of you just take over and give us some of your residual thoughts about where we stand. Uh, Your Holiness, uh, it has been a wonderful meeting. Uh, <coughs> they'll beam you up. Uh, hopefully my mic will come on yeah. in a minute. This has been a very wonderful meeting and I'd like to again express our gratitude for you spending so much time with us. Uh, There is a theme which uh, I mentioned at the very outset of the meeting, which I think has been preserved through much of the meeting that I'd like to come back to. And that is that I think that there's a remarkable convergence between a key insight that has emerged in modern neuroscience and a key insight from the contemplative traditions. Uh, And that is that virtuous qualities of the human mind can be regarded as skills which can be cultivated. And the fact of brain plasticity provides for us a foundation for understanding how the cultivation of these qualities may be supported by uh, the brain and how the brain may change in response to these practices. When I have gone out, Your Holiness, and and talked about this work, which I have uh, uh, now very freely done since I met you more than 10 years ago, and you've been an inspiration to do that, what I find uh, is that there is an increased receptivity to these ideas and that the scientific research is beginning to play a role in in increasing the acceptance of this idea that we're not stuck where we are. We're not stuck at our set points, but rather that the mind can really be transformed. I envision a time when in school, school children in the United States and other Western cultures are required to attend what's called PE. It stands for physical education. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they also attend a class called ME for mental education? I believe that your participation and your involvement with us uh, is so inspiring to help us 
spread this important message. And I think that the scientific work that we're doing is providing one small piece of that larger mm -hmm. message. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to just acknowledge that John and I go back 30 years. Um, we first met in Cambridge. Uh, I was a graduate student, and John was in the middle of a career transition from a molecular biologist mm -hmm. to a meditation teacher. <laughs> and uh, he helped provide me with the beginning of my alternative education in mental training beginning in the 1970s. Uh, and so for us to be doing this together is really uh, a wonderful uh, 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 a, a wonderful circle coming uh, around. Uh, and I don't think either of us envisioned that we would be in a situation like this today, but it feels so, so perfect that we are. <laughs> I would also like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to one other person. Adam Engel is soon going to come on stage to thank many other people, but I want to take this opportunity to thank Adam Engel. Adam has worked tirelessly, indefatigably, on behalf of all of us for so many years, and uh, uh, we would not have these meetings without his dedication mm -hmm. and fine work. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is uh, um, wonderful that you are here, that you exist on this planet to make this possible, and we're all so grateful. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. <laughs> John, do you and, have a... And thank you, Your Holiness. Your Holiness. My heart is full at this moment. I feel tremendous sense of gratitude and happiness for the opportunities that you continually afford us to look more deeply into the nature of reality, to remind ourselves how little we understand the nature of reality or of ourselves. And rather than getting frightened by that condition, to mm -hmm. actually realize that it is an incredible invitation to part the veil of our own uh, con highly conditioned and habitual seeing and see beyond to something that is, in some sense, much more deeply true of who and how we are individually as people and collectively as all of us. And it's just unbelievably moving to me that you can ceaselessly function around the world to bring this kind of energy to humanity, making house call after house call from the house of the <laughs> DAR to the White House to the next house that you're going to. And in some way or other, in your being, as I see it at least, embody what it truly might mean for each one of us to be human. Now, I like to say often, because I know that people put you on a pedestal and I know that you have said many, many times that you are simply a Buddhist monk, that nobody, people, we do not have, if you'll pardon my using this term, Father Thomas, a snowball's chance in hell. Double take some translation. <laughs> of ever becoming the Dalai Lama. We don't have a chance to ever become the Dalai Lama. 
or anybody else that we put on some kind of pedestal and say <laughs> that's 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 where <laughs> it's at. I think you can be the next Dalai Lama. <laughs> French. Your Holiness. French Dalai Lama. French Dalai Lama. Your Holiness. French Dalai Lama. <laughs> You, you would certainly know better than anybody. <laughs> But I, the point is, I think, that what is most likely, what has the greatest potential, is that we have a chance, and sometimes it's potentially a very fleeting chance, called a human lifetime, in which to actually maybe move in closer to who we actually might be, or already are. And we live, in a sense, in our thoughts and our delusions about how things are and who we are as opposed to what we actually are. What Francisco Varela, the co-founder of Mind and Life with Adam Engel, called uh, mindful, embodied mindful awareness. So in closing, I'd like just to just cite, uh, say something about um, uh, Father Thomas's I think, very inclusive invitation to remember what it actually means to love and in some sense be in love and be love, so to speak. There's a, a few lines from Wordsworth pre Prelude that goes, there's a dark, invisible workmanship that unifies discordant elements. And I think of the continual fluxing and... Uh, deconstructing and, and coherence of the brain moment by moment by moment. There's a dark, invisible workmanship that unifies discordant elements and makes them move in one society. And whether you call it Tao, or whether you call it Dharma, or whether you call it God, or whether you call it I don't have the slightest idea, there is still the sense that we are participating in something quite extraordinary, quite mysterious, and that links your talk, Wolf, with your talk, Ralph, about how we could actually, and with everybody in this room, because this time together has been like a bell ringing. Five sessions over two and a half days, the bell has now rung, but the reverberations have the potential to go out infinitely, and we do not know what the consequences are of having overheard or eavesdropped on this conversation in His Holiness's portable living room. <laughs> But whatever the consequences are, I would suggest that they have to do with all the questions that you asked that you didn't get answered. And now, in some sense, the challenge is to ask where those questions come from in the first place. And what your job on the planet is, whether it has to do with children, whether it has to do with trauma, whether it has to do with the military, whether it has to do with government, to ask, what is my job on this planet in this moment, given who I am and everything I know and whatever has come from here, to in some way cohere and synchronized into some deeper manifestation of what it might actually mean to be a homo sapiens sapiens, the species that knows and knows that it knows, in other words, awareness, rather than go back to sleep on your way home. So thank you, one, and thank you all. Adam, it's yours. Uh, Adam, I've got to say one more thing. I'm sorry, but it will be very short. But uh, I was just so touched by what Richie said and uh, just want to uh, bow to him as uh, the deepest manifestation of this, the holding different worlds in a way that truly has heart. And I just value our friendship tremendously. And 
really uh, am deeply appreciative of you of giving us the opportunity to, in some sense, co-host and be co-program chairs, developing and bringing this meeting to this particular point. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. You guys have stolen a little bit of my thunder. I was going to talk about your relationship over the last 35 years. So I'll pass No, you can do part. the third person approach. We've just done the first one. <laughs> but everything that starts has to have a, an end. And we're just about ready to end. And I've got a few housekeeping details. And then I just want to thank a few people. First of all, uh, when we finish our remarks and His Holiness starts to leave, if you could stay in your places until we can clear the stage and some of the presenters here have an opportunity to, to leave as well. Uh, His Holiness is going to be thanking the presenters backstage. And also I've been asked to, to ask you to leave on the 18th Street and the C Street because they've closed off D Street. Um, Your Holiness, um, I'd just like to reflect together on the improbability of us being here today. I mean, it, it just, it continually amazes me. His Holiness was, was born in, a, in one of the most remote regions on the planet. I mean, unquestionably. And has become one of the leading spiritual leaders on the planet and is dedicated steadfastly to this commitment of this interchange between science and spirituality. And I just find that so incredibly amazing. And I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone here and everyone who has ever been involved in the Mind and Life Institute for magnetizing us and drawing us together in this uh, joint quest uh, for the benefit of humanity. I'd also like to thank uh, someone who isn't publicly thanked a lot, and that is your brother, Tenzin Chogel, who happens to be up here, who was actually the, the, the first person that I spoke to uh, uh, in His Holiness's um, entourage about Mind and Life and has been a steadfast friend and supporter of the Mind and Life Institute. Uh, and a very close personal friend, and also the members of the private office who put up with my constant badgering to try and get on His Holiness's schedule. Um, Richie and John have already acknowledged their, uh, their uh, uh, past history together of 35 years. It's another improbability that two guys who met when they were graduate students, you know, have stayed together all this time and have um, you know, come together and, and led this, you know, over, um, you know, the last decade and will continue to lead that. Um, and so it's a pleasure to work with you guys. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank all of the presenters and panelists. You have no idea how much effort they have to put into making this happen. Uh, you know, it, it, there are literally days of preparation and meetings and conference calls and phone calls in order to, for them to relearn a new way of presenting and being in this kind of an environment. And I just want you all to understand and to acknowledge, um, you know, how wonderful they have been in, um, you know, in making this happen. And now I want to introduce two of the most incredible women I know, um, <laughs> Sydney Prince and Nancy Mayer. I want you no, wait, 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 wait. I want you to know that there is not one single detail in organizing this whole event that hasn't been attended to by one of these two women. And I'd like to ask you to stand up and show them your appreciation. <laughs>
and this is the rest of our key team here. Um, Chris Maloney, Janice Pagel, Barry Bear, Kathy Chin Ortega, David Mayer, Nancy's husband, uh, and Janet Hughes, and John Waterman. So um, this is the team that has manifested all of this for you. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers and everyone else who's worked on this. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you for joining in this exploration and for joining uh, what I've always thought of as the Mind and Life family. Um, it's, a, it's a strange type of organization, business organization, but that's the one that I choose to lead at this point in time. And I hope that our efforts here have, uh, have done something to stimulate all of you uh, to continue this exploration in your lives. And finally, I'd like to um, close with a, you know, a Buddhist practice of dedicating, uh, dedicating the merit of whatever, uh, whatever benefit and merit that we have created here that we dedicate uh, for the benefit of all beings. Thank you. <laughs>